This tutorial took me so long. You have no idea. I've been working on this for two weeks and it has driven me crazy. I would not recommend anyone to actually follow this unless you are batshit insane. Having said that, I've put in all this work. I might as well show you how to do it now. Before we start though, I will say most of this is actually sped up. I do have tutorials down in the description for more in detail instructions for how to do pretty much everything. So if there is something you're not sure about, just look there. Also during the process of making this, make sure to visit a therapist at least three times a week. You will need it. We're going to go up to the top and we're going to add in a motion tracking workspace. Then we're going to load in our footage. I have it already saved out as a sequence of images, but if you want to learn how to do that, then I will have a card up on screen now. So I just pressed set scene frames and prefetch to load in the footage and make it the right length. I will then press detect features and lower the settings until I feel like enough features are detected. You shouldn't worry too much about this. It doesn't really matter if there aren't a lot, as long as there are more than eight. I will then press Ctrl T to track the entire thing. And I'll now go and delete all the big curves in the graph editor. I was going to make a full-on tutorial about doing tracking, but to be honest, there are people who have done it way better, so I will link to them as well. I'm currently adding tracking points in places I feel like they are necessary, and messing with the settings in the end panel in order to make them more accurate. Sometimes if you turn off the red channel or the green channel or the blue channel, it makes it better. Once I've done that, then I solve backwards. You can do this by pressing Ctrl Shift T or by going to the timeline menu. I'm then again deleting the tracks that didn't work so well with large spikes. Now you can also clip these trackers so that the start or the end aren't included. Do this by pressing this button. So then go to the solve panel and press solve camera motion. It's now time to clean up the track. So there's a button called clean tracks and by pressing it you can select different trackers that have a really high reprojection value. If you're finding that your reprojection error for the entire solve is super high, this is probably due to your keyframes not being set properly. Blender sets this automatically if you tick the checkbox. I don't really see any purpose in trying to set it yourself, but you can do if you want to. Once you're happy with the numbers, you can also turn off the checkbox and it will use the same keyframes to judge distances afterwards. Then there's the refine option, which will help you set your focal length and your K1 and K2 values, which decide how distorted your image is. Every camera has a little bit of lens distortion. Now, if you go to the clip display, there is an info checkbox which you can turn on to see all the different values for each tracker, including its reproduction error. Now the biggest theme you'll see throughout this entire video is that most of it is just messing with values and trying to solve it until it works. There is no fast way of doing this. It is going to be different for everyone's video. There aren't a set of inputs that I can give you right now and say that'll work perfectly. But Honestly, the tracking doesn't take that long. Now at this point, I'm adding two tracks to the ground in order to decide which direction the y-axis is going to be in. You don't need to track for all of your footage, just a bit. So I cut out. So when you're ready, go to the bottom of the solve panel and there are two buttons, one that says set as background and the other one that says set up tracking scene. Press those. Once you do that, you should see your scene in the viewport. Now it's time to line it up. So select one tracker and press set as origin. And then select another tracker and press set Y axis. It's going to line up with the origin tracker. Now, if you go back to the layout panel, you won't actually be able to see your trackers unless you go to the display menu and click the option to view them. You can also set the scale here too. Now I'm going to go to the compositing workspace and I want to export the undistorted version of the image. Once you've set up your 3D scene, these nodes will automatically appear in your compositing panel. Now we only need the undistorted footage 
So I'm going to bring the composite node up to the top and connect it up. Make sure you know where you're going to be rendering it out, otherwise you might overwrite something that you were doing before. I learned this the hard way, several times. You also may have noticed that I deleted the render layers. This is because regardless of what you're outputting, Blender will automatically render stuff out when you're exporting. So I would actually recommend deleting these until you've exported your undistorted footage and then bring them back just by pressing Ctrl Z. So I took quite a bit of time to actually make sure the orientation of my scene was correct. I did this by rotating the camera around the 3D cursor. Once that was done, I added a plane and I started extruding it to make the shape of my house. I was very lucky that most things lined up, but you really don't need to worry if it doesn't line up perfectly. The important thing is that it looks like it lines up through the camera. As you can see here, I move things way out of proportion. That normally is straight, but it looks very bent when you look at it from a different angle. But from the point of view of the camera, it doesn't matter. I then create this fridge here. It was there for temporary storage, and we just haven't moved it yet. We don't even use it anymore. I'm going to make the basic shape, and then I'm going to bevel it. Now you can mess around with the shape as much as you want, but honestly it really doesn't matter that much. Especially since this object is simply there to interact with fluid, and not actually to change what my scene looks like. Now I do create the window with the purpose of adding light to it later, so that's different. I then extrude the back room that the fluid actually is going to come out of, and I extrude a door as well. Now this hallway also has two windows. They're kind of hard to see, but they're off to the left. I just extrude them in a little bit so I can place some lights in them later. Now the stuff above the fridge, I decide to remove altogether later on. I add an area light into every single window. The two windows on the left have linked area lights, which you can do by placing one and then pressing Alt-D to duplicate it with the same settings. This means that if I change one light, the other one will change too. Now for the sake of the fluid, it's important to make sure the normals are facing inwards on your model. If you go to the view display, you can actually view which direction your normals are facing in. It's very useful. If you press Shift-N and then press Make Normals Inside, all the normals will face inside. I can then finally add the domain for the fluid. This is what will contain all the blood, so you must make sure that everything is fit inside. I'll select the walls and I will give them a thickness. Now the thickness is pretty low but I eventually set it to be much higher. Set it to be about 0.5 or something. This means there is no chance on earth of fluid escaping. You should also do the same thing with the door. I then add a little box for the inflow. This is where all the fluid is going to come out of. You can make it much smaller than you think. I also go back to the wall object and bring up the floor so that the fluid can be pushed out even more. Make sure to save regularly. It'll save you. 
I drag out the domain to encompass the thickness of the walls as well. Now it's time to look at the settings for the inflow and the domain. So for the inflow, you want the flow type to be set to fluid and the flow behavior to be set to inflow. The domain is much more complicated though. The resolution division decides how high res your fluid is. The time scale decides how slow or fast your liquid is. Most of the other settings don't matter that much, but under particles, you have the options between spray, foam, and bubbles. Now, I don't recommend having foam or bubbles on for this. You only need spray. Spray are simply the extra particles that fly off the fluid. Foam is for a beach, and bubbles is for a bubble bath, I guess? Under mesh, you don't need to mess with any of the settings there either, as long as the checkbox is turned on. Then, decide where you're going to save out your cache. Currently, I have the cache type set to replay, which means if I press space, the fluid will simulate. However, it does take a long time. And if you have your particles and mesh turned on, they will also attempt to simulate at the same time. I eventually switch to modular, which allows me to just press a bake button and then come back in like 10 minutes. Now you'll notice the fluid is coming up above the door and if I was to let it run out a lot longer, it would also go through the hinge as well, which I don't want. So I'm going to solve that problem right now. Simply extruding that bit of the hinge out and uh, making sure it hits into the wall so that there's no part with zero thickness. After this it's just a matter of pressing bake a lot and seeing what happens. Now another thing that setting the cache to modular allows you to do is to start baking in minus frames. This means that on frame 1 the fluid will have already flown down a bit. This is extremely useful for timing purposes. Now when you press bake you can usually press escape at any point and then press resume to continue simulating. But I don't recommend you do this. I found that in my testing, all of the obstacles, which are the walls, the fridge, and the door, just no longer work for some weird reason afterwards. So I'd recommend, even if you have modular turned on, you bake the entire simulation in one go. At least the data. You don't need to be worried about the mesh or the particles as much. Now, I recommend you keep the resolution pretty low, like 64, and just mess with all the other settings until you have something you're happy with. I eventually have the time scale at 0.13, but most of the other settings I keep exactly the same. I do, however, open up the door a little bit more to let more fluid through. All this stuff will appear through testing, though. There is no fast way of doing this. You have to run the simulation a bunch of times to figure it out. So once your mesh and particles are baked, it's time to actually make those particles appear in your render. I'm going to add an icosphere, and then I'm going to click on that little menu that allows you to view the settings. You can also do this by pressing F9, I believe. And I'm going to turn down the resolution to 1. I'll also set the icosphere radius to be 0.5, which means the diameter is 1. This means that the icosphere will appear at the same size as the particles in the viewport as you see them now. So if you go to the particle settings panel, you'll see liquid and spray and maybe bubbles and foam too. You don't need those. I simulated bubbles for some reason. I don't know why. You'll see two icons, one that looks like a monitor, that's for viewing stuff in your display port, and one for camera, which is for viewing stuff in the render. You can turn this off for liquid as it is the data that you first render out but is hidden by the mesh. And then you can set your spray particle system to be rendered as an object and select the icosphere. Now you do not want to select collection. You might want to have particles of different size. I don't know how you do this. If you do select a collection with particles of different size, 
it looks like this, and for some reason, it chooses a different particle for each frame at random. So none of the particles are consistent. Now I decide to turn off display for the particles in the viewport. This makes everything just run much faster, makes it way easier to do stuff. And then I'm going to render this out as a play blast. You can do this by setting the render engine to be workbench, which means it'll just render out in the viewport basically. I'm going to set this to be a math cap. I take a hot minute to choose the one I like. And actually you can select your object, the blood that is, and change the material to make it look red. Now if you are using a matte cap, I will tell you that the roughness and metallic values have no effect whatsoever, so there is no point changing them. If you render it out in studio though, and you don't use a matte cap, then they will be visible. Save it as a PNG sequence and then just press Ctrl F12. Now if you look at my final render, you'll notice I don't have any particles. There are also a bunch of other things that have changed quite a lot. I decided to up the resolution instead. All of this will be explained in part 2, along with how to actually light your scene and create the blood material and everything else. So look forward to that very very soon.